Good morning and welcome to TechFire this morning in association with Manage Engine. My name is Niall Kitson. I'm the editor of Tech Central and your moderator for this webinar, uh, where over the next hour we will be asking the burning question, how do you get from risk to resilience in endpoint security? To explore this topic, we will be joined by Manage Engine's Romanis Prabhu Raymond, Global Head of Technical Support for Endpoint Management and Security, and Enda Martin, Head of IT at Windsor Motors. At registration, you had the chance to submit a question for the Q&A section later on. We are also taking questions in the chat uh, during each talk, which will be moderated by our producers, Nick and Julia. So how can you get from risk to resilience in endpoint security? It's an important question to ask at a time when remote and hybrid working styles are becoming the norm. According to Manage Engine's digital readiness survey, 83% of executives and IT professionals polled believe remote workers increase security risks. Yet only 56% of companies have changed their security strategy to reflect this. Furthermore, cybercrime is big business and only getting bigger. A report by Intrusion Inc. found that cybercrime is expected to cost the world $10.5 trillion in 2025. If you're to translate that into terms of GDP, that would be the third largest economy in the world behind the US and China. Then there is the cost of cleanup. IBM Security says the average cost of a data breach this year is $4.35 million, which is resulting in more expensive products and services for everyone as companies struggle to recoup their losses in data and reputation and pass those hard costs of recovery along to customers. It's too expensive not to have a constantly evolving approach to security, yet almost half of companies are neglecting to maintain and support endpoints, from laptops and smartphones to the people using them. Hopefully by the end of this session, you will have some ideas on how to make your organization more resilient to attack. So before we get started, we're going to run the first of three polls this morning. And we're going to ask you all, has your company changed its approach to endpoint security since 2020? So effectively, since the start of uh, the pandemic lockdowns in Ireland. So Nick, if you'd like to deploy the survey and we'll leave it up for a few seconds and it's a very simple yes or no, uh, we'll log the answers and then address them in more detail during the Q&A session. Okay, Nick, if you'd like to close off that survey. And we have an 86% yes. So a fairly, fairly resounding uh, result there on the change to endpoint security approach. I'd now like to welcome our first guest, Romanis Prabhu Raymond. Global Head of Technical Support for Endpoint Management and Security at Manage Engine. Romanis is responsible for the onboarding, product training, and implementation and support experience for all <coughs> Manage Engine customers. He also heads the product, the product evangelist professional services, partner certification, and customer service teams. Romanis, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Neil. So uh, we're going to have a, a chat about sort of the, the broad level questions, I suppose. And when we talk about endpoint security and security in general, we're talking about risk. So how do you define risk in today's world? And how has that definition evolved over the past few years? That's a great question. So uh, I want to give you a contra perspective uh, for the risk, right? Risk is, uh, is an experience, which in turn invokes sense of security and strategy to protect your business and give resilience to the business, right? So if you look uh, the risk in terms of experience, yes, it triggers uh, uh, the positive way of looking at uh, the sense of security, right? 
So we usually don't celebrate uh, our daily routines, mundane tasks as experience. But when there is a challenge or deviation from the routine, we remember that as an experience, right? So we try to learn and we try to become future proof so that any such attacks, any such risk in future could be handled better, right? So I want to define this by uh, uh, taking example of the small and medium sized organization. Let's leave the enterprise, big ones, right? Small and medium. Now, uh, they have the skill shortage. Now that's one of the broader things which are discussed, skill shortage. In comparison with the modern day threat landscape, right? But when you compare that, it, there is a definitely a skill shortage. Now think about this, any IT member in that small and medium, right? Who's not uh, very skilled in terms of programming, networking, cyber security, things like that, could become a threat to the organization just by tying up with the RAS service. Just like that, he could become a threat actor and would be able to launch an attack on the organization. So that is the level of risk which threat actors have built over the years, right? So you don't need to have the skill set. You don't need to have right people aligned or strategies to be aligned to launch an attack. It's a simple sign up with a RAS service and you should be able to do that. 98% of all the required services, tools, tactics, techniques, everything is provided as a bundle, right? Now, this is something that we have to consider as real risk for the organization, right? Usually we say risk is a product of uh, vulnerability uh, against uh, the uh, threat, right? Over an asset. But uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you consider ransomware, right? Microsoft has a beautiful uh, report which says ransomware has evolved in such a way that uh, uh, it is now the most fearsome threat for the organization, right? Now they say it's targeted or human operated. So everybody remembers that 2016 uh, attacks like uh, Vanacry or NotPetya, right? Now there are costs cost associated to the attacks, but they are all related to the victims, not in terms of threat actors or profit to them. But Attacks which are happening now are completely a profit oriented or return on the investment what the threat actors have done. So it is more profitable. So they do that based on uh, extortion, double extortion, triple extortion, irrespective of the size of the organization, small, medium, large, right? Uh, irrespective of the industry, it could be medical, it could be finance, it could be organization, manufacturing, anything. Now, that is the level of growth of the uh, risk with the more sophisticated uh, uh, threat actors or technology being used for that. So I, I see, uh, as Microsoft puts it, it from nowhere, from nowhere uh, making money, now it's very profitable revenue generating business for the threat actors. So the risk has actually grown uh, in a real fearsome manner. So to, to follow on from that point, how can businesses then identify blind spots uh, in their networks on sort of that end user or, you know, end point level? Okay, so uh, that's a great point. So blind spots uh, have to be identified. But before identifying their blind spots, you should know what is there for you to be taken care has to be done. In the sense, in terms of vulnerability, you should address your known vulnerabilities, right? Known vulnerabilities are nothing but the patches released by the vendors. It could be OS, third party, or any applications, any OS, uh, any number of heterogeneous OS applications you have, you should be able to patch them. This is first layer of defense, right? Blind spots are basically your unknown vulnerabilities, right? Now, uh, think about this. 
So you have uh, your patches done. But apart from the patches, there are still vulnerabilities open. Could be port, you could be your uh, unwanted protocol, obsolete protocols like WannaCry attacked, uh, uh, used the SMB v1 version, which had a fix probably a couple of weeks before the attack was launched, right? Now, misconfigurations, all these vulnerability has to be brought to your visibility, and then you should be able to make uh, some controls over that. Similarly, whitelisting, blacklisting of the applications. So this will stop unwanted malware entering into the organization. So you should be able to have better visibility using that. Uh, network access control like uh, uh, control, meaning not all endpoints are always managed, monitored by your endpoint management server. So when they are away, the security posture is changed uh, for the organization. Now the SAS2 got uh, get this upgraded eventually. So when it connects back to the production server, now this would be quarantined and then moved, right? Now, these are all the areas where you should be able to have better spotlights so that the blind spots can be uh, seen visibly and you should be able to take control. Similarly, uh, your uh, DLP, what is sensitive data according to your organizations? Have you defined that? So once you have defined that, it could be PII, PHI, anything. So a leak of that through copying or sending mail or USB ports, right? That should be uh, blocked completely. So the blind spot like this in terms of leaking data, in terms of encryption, man in the uh, uh, middle attack kind of stuff and whitelisting, blacklisting, vulnerability. Now all those things I think are the blind spots. So once you have better visibility, you should be able to uh, put right security controls on them so that your business is secure. So what are some of the attack vectors or unknown vul vulnerabilities that organizations tend to overlook in today's cybersecurity battle? Um, right, probably I'll take uh, this question as unknown, unknown. Because we have seen uh, patching, which is known vulnerability, which has been handled already. And there is unknown area, uh, unknown vulnerability, that we could get better spotlights and we can have better security control for that. The third level is about unknown, unknown area. So when you talk about unknown, unknown, the uh, vulnerability is unknown, the remediation is unknown. So how do you go about stop this? One, you have to understand what historical uh, attacks have happened and what were the tactics, techniques used in that and you should be able to find that and stop if that is going to happen in your network. This is one way. The other one is you need to uh, baseline the behavior of your endpoint, right? Now, when you understand this baseline, your behavior of the endpoint, any new uh, approach, any new changes in that would be uh, moved to suspicious activity and then you should be able to uh, mark it as malicious or allow that. Now, combination of uh, historical attacks and how uh, the tactics, techniques were used and the baselining of the endpoints according to one particular, your network, and then building uh, AI and ML knowledge on that would be uh, enabling you to stop unknown, unknown uh, level of attacks which could happen on the business. So let's look at the role of leadership here. And, you know, how is the role of leadership crucial to the success of any incident response plan? I suppose we should start looking at where responsibility for developing response plan sort of begins. Correct, correct, right? So uh, they always say that you, you, you have to be prepared for the war, right? Now you cannot just uh, take the war when it comes upon you. Now. There are a lot of things in terms of incident. Uh, you have to keep everything prepared. And in, in, in spite of having well-preparedness and you are able to have strategic approach to protect your endpoint and monitor it, right? Things happen, right? When incidents happen, how are you going to uh, handle that? 
So do you have a backup plan? And do you have uh, the uh, sufficient information to do the investigation for the digital forensic? Like your, your endpoint, EDR, endpoint detection and response should be able to give visibility in terms of endpoint, right? What is happening? And if you have a XDR, extended detection and response, that would enable you to get uh, all security information from all security uh, gateways so that you can have a better perspective and start uh, doing better investigation. So the investigation will allow you to have uh, the, uh, the, the root of the threat actor, how we have infiltrated and exfiltrated, whether any data has been taken or uh, all those things, findings should be uh, made and you should be able to make necessary uh, action based on that. So uh, it's very crucial that uh, the leadership uh, has plans for the incident response and keep everything prepared, uh, keep it ready for uh, any such thing which could happen. Thank you, Romanus. Uh, and Romanus will be back with us for the Q&A after our customer interview. This brings us to our second poll of the morning, where we are asking, are you more or less confident in your organization's ability to spot threats since the pandemic? And the options are more confident, less confident, or about the same. And Nick, I think we can close off the survey there. And we have 55% more confident, but quite an interesting statistic there in 15% less, but 30% about the same. And I think that's something we'll probably return to. It's almost a, a third of respondents. So we are now joined by Enda Martin, Head of IT with Windsor Motors. Windsor Motors Group is a leading approved dealer for Nissan, Opel, Peugeot, Renault, Dacia, Citroen and Mazda in Ireland. Enda is responsible for developing and implementing IT strategy for the group, comprising all hardware, software, network infrastructure and telecommunications. Enda, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Niall. And well done in getting all the franchises right. I'd be in trouble if you hadn't, you know. <laughs> um, so, and I, I suppose let's have a look at the nuts and bolts of the operation. Um, how many endpoints are you roughly dealing with you at, and how has that number changed since the pandemic? Has it increased or decreased? Uh, it has actually remained roughly the same. We have approximately 300 endpoints um, at, at the minute and we have uh, 14 sites. So, and they range from Motor Mall in Finglas, which would have some in the region of 50 to 55 endpoints to Clonee, which would have maybe 15 to 20. So, uh, and they are scattered mostly around Dublin, one and Galway as well. So when it comes to endpoint management, uh, one of the points that we explored previously was the idea of culture clash, where mm -hmm. IT departments are very often frustrated with the users that don't understand their problems. Um, to pick on one department, let's let's have a look at sales where they have a very different uh, approach to security, um, you know, than IT. And um, so, how have you managed that particular culture clash at a time when you don't necessarily have somebody over somebody's shoulder going, actually, that's wrong, do this differently? Um, well, one way we do it obviously is by restricting um, permissions and restricting access to the systems, uh, particularly for our. Um, our sales staff, as you mentioned, we had been lucky when the pandemic actually hit that we had uh, migrated a lot of our sales staff to Microsoft Surface tablets, which meant that they were very easy to move to remote working rather than actually if they had been desktop based, which they had been previously. But that also has its own risks, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so apart from restricting access and monitoring access as well and ensuring that any endpoints are fully patched and up to date, We've spent a lot of time focusing on training end users also and trying to um, educate them in the risks of what can happen if you enter your credentials incorrectly in the, <laughs> to the wrong email, a phishing email, whatever, and what the consequences of that can be. So what we do is um, 
apart from the endpoint management which we have with manage engine and also with our antivirus and endpoint security um we also um have set up um online training online security training and we also fish our users on a monthly basis as well so every user in the company will actually get a fake phishing email and we can monitor the response and monitor who needs extra education and extra training so um if the user actually clicks on an incorrect link whatever they've got a pop-up saying you really shouldn't have done that and then we have to have you know a chat with them to make sure that they're aware of the secure the consequences of going to the wrong place or clicking on the wrong thing it raises a fairly interesting problem where you might improve awareness but not necessarily behavior have you come across cases where people are you know better able to recognize uh, a problem but maybe on impulse still manage to click on one of your sort of mock phishing emails yeah um that happens sometimes um and that kind of becomes a management issue if somebody's continuously doing this where we need to actually really sit down and it's see it's a two it's a two-handed approach the one hand is the um the fake fishing the other hand is also the online training so like if somebody requires more training you need to push them towards that but one other thing we have noticed as well is that we actually have a higher incidence now of false positives being reported by users which is brilliant because they'll send a note to our help test say i got this it looks dodgy and once you investigate it actually isn't but we'd much rather them doing that and asking the question before they go anywhere with an email rather than just far and away entering their credentials where, wherever they possibly can so yes some we have one or two recidivist users but we also have heightened awareness where other users are actually coming to us more often and asking more about about security issues there's one problem that uh one imagines uh is fairly common is finding the time to schedule uh, training sessions with employees who perhaps feel their time is better spent uh, elsewhere. Have you found that to be a problem? Uh, yes, um, the solution that we use uh, allows us to actually monitor the time taken for employees to to go through the training. Uh, and so we can see when it's been completed or when it's not been completed, and then they will get reminders as well. We have had occasions where we've had a 45 minute uh, course completed in 12 which kind of, you know, begs the question, was it actually completed or was it somebody just hitting next as quickly as they possibly could? So, but again, we have visibility of that and we said, you didn't really do that properly. Can you please redo the, the course? Because as far as we're concerned, you didn't actually see it. So it does raise awareness and it does, um, it, uh, users are aware that, that we are actually monitoring whether they're actually completing the courses or not. But again, we've also had to go through management to say, we need to allow our users the time to, do these courses because um, they are very much a risk factor when it comes to uh, to the security of the company and the, the information that we have. On that point of information, then uh, yeah. one of the great problems I think companies have is consistency uh, and making sure data is treated with the appropriate respect across the board by everybody have you found that to be uh, a problem across the business you know either during pandemic times or, or during the return um it's something that we always have to keep a close eye on and again that comes down to what i mentioned earlier about access and ensuring that users only have access to the data that's actually relevant to them so on the one hand you don't want to limit um salespeople's ability to see uh, customer history where it's appropriate but on the other hand as well you do need to actually tie down access where possible uh, and also given the fact that our crm solution is a hosted solution it's dynamics 365 um that can lead to its own uh, challenges but again by working on the actual security roles and permissions that the individual users have we can actually tie down their access to the to the data but yeah it's something we're very very aware of you started mentioning some of the solutions that you're using there at the moment. Uh, what, what kind of suite uh, sort of are, are, are you using? Um, well, for our desktop management, uh, our endpoint management rather, excuse me, it's been rebranded. So it's the endpoint, um, endpoint central from Manage Engine. So that would be for all of our patching. That would also be our MDM solution as well. We have our own um, app store. So uh, managed devices within our um, managed mobile devices, we can publish any apps that we want and not publish other apps as well, which is also vitally important. Um, 
for security for antivirus, we would use um, Sophos Intercept X on our endpoints for endpoint security. And then the uh, company we use for um, um, the fake phishing, et cetera, is no before for the online security and the, the fake phishing testing as well. So then looking towards the future, um, what sort of problems do you foresee uh, having sort of uh, given this sort of new threat landscape? Um, I suppose it's we're, we're we're now in a situation. I suppose you could say we're 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 in the future now as regards the mobility of the the uh, workforce because while a lot of our staff would have would would not have the ability to work remotely, anyone in our service departments, our parts departments, servicing cars that can't be done remotely. That has to be done on site. However, a lot of our admin, uh, a lot of our sales can actually be done remotely. So uh, managing the hybrid landscape, that's really going to be, it has come up, it came up, you know, sharply in 2020. And just that's going to become more and more of, of um, uh, an element of the overall landscape. So I think that that's really where it's going to be coming for us. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, we'd like to jump into our third poll of the morning, Nick, if you'd have that ready for us, where we're asking, do you have a training schedule for endpoint security awareness, sort of following up on a point that Enda raised there? Would you like to close that off? And 76% yes. So I think we, we've had some fairly, uh, for want of a better term, predictable, but also quite encouraging answers this morning on our polls, which we'll, we'll deepen, we'll dig into a little bit more. I'd like to welcome Romanis back to uh, the conversation for our audience Q&A. A uh, quick reminder, we'll be keeping an eye on the chat for any questions and comments for the panel, uh, and we'll do our best to get to them uh, before time. Um, before we went online, we, we had a, a, an interesting comment that was sent to us or, or pre-submitted to us that turned out to be a lot more interesting than we would have thought initially. And that is, how, you, how do you define an endpoint or, or what is endpoint security? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll pick on you first with that question. Uh, I suppose that's a question that, you know, five or ten years ago would have been far easier to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, your endpoint could be anything now, like I say, given the fact that um, obviously your PCs, Surface tablets, laptops, mobile devices, but also given the fact that our, like I mentioned, our CRM is available online, that, you know, you could pick up an iPad anywhere in the world and basically browse the URL and technically, if you have the right authentication, log on to, so, you know, where, where does it stop <laughs> is probably the, the right answer now, let's say. Uh, Romanos? Oh, yeah. So, uh, just wanted to add a couple of things what Enda has said, right? Um, IoT are uh, another areas where uh, organizations have considering it as an endpoint, right? Apart from servers, workstations, laptops, uh, mobile devices, iPads, right? IoTs are uh, uh, medical IoTs. Uh, and manufacturing level. So that's where uh, you you consider them as endpoint, right? Now, when you talk about the security for uh, for endpoints like uh, systems, right? When you have uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft operating system, or Linux, or uh, Mac, right? You have, uh, or Chromebook, you have a defined way of managing them. But when it comes to IoTs, but still there is a lot of uh, struggle in terms of uh, uh, protecting them and ensuring them. So uh, uh, a policy which could allow the end user to work uh, creatively or uh, in a productive manner for the organization at the same time, uh, protecting the data, right? So we, we, we knew that earlier, we had SCCM, I mean, system, system management, then it moved to mobile device management, right? The devices were in focus. Then it moved to EMM, endpoint, end I mean, uh, enterprise mobility management. So that's where the focus moved from to safeguard even the content than the device, right? 
And now we are in the unified endpoint management, right? So it's both important, the a device and uh, more than that, the content or uh, the intellectual property of the organization, which is inside the, uh, the endpoint should be protected. So that's where uh, the endpoint security focuses more on. That's an interesting point you raised about medical devices there. Do you find that it's uh, as big or a bigger problem in fields that maybe you wouldn't associate with particularly strong uh, IT practices, especially I'm, I'm hearkening back to our own experience uh, here in Ireland with the um, HSE hack. Um, do you find medical devices to be a bigger problem? Uh, I mean, they have to be brought under uh, the proper practices, right? Now, uh, if you look, look at the uh, a recent attack, right, in terms of ransomware or in terms of cyber uh, data leak, right? Uh, the medical or the healthcare industry is one, or the pharma industry is the one which were targeted, right? Now, you could you could say that the reason for that is there is uh, IT expertise or the, it, the they don't have a proper uh, setup or they haven't given such uh, importance to the uh, data security of that. Now it's a different story, but initially when, when the attacks happened, it was very open, right? Effortless uh, attack for the uh, uh, threat actors to penetrate into uh, organization, particularly using the IoT devices because uh, all the endpoints were actually managed. The, uh, the, the IoTs were wide open and it easy to uh, get through that to get into the uh, business or the production network. So in that way, uh, medical IoT devices uh, needs more focus, more practices. And as uh, Enda was talking about training, so people in the medical uh, healthcare industry need to have more training because it's not only used by the professionals, IT professionals, but uh, uh, but the other professionals, uh, healthcare professionals. So unless it is uh, given with proper training and uh, uh, the way it has to be maintained, then it's going to be really a challenge. I'd just like to dip into some of the uh, audience submitted questions here. Uh, Enda, I'll ask you to uh, address this first. Uh, what are the best <clears throat> company policies to enforce across all endpoints in an organization? Uh, what is your recommended approach to living off the land, if you will? Um, I suppose um, the policies that we would enforce across all endpoints within Windsor would be um, that we would try to restrict access only where it's appropriate, I suppose, broadly. I know that's kind of, it's a very broad answer to the question, but also um, for the users themselves that we restrict the access to for users as to where it's appropriate. That can be very difficult to track down sometimes, but that's really, I suppose, um, an overall policy that we would have an overarching policy and the other one as well would be obviously um remote access and you know hardening the um the authentication rules when it comes to remote access that if you have a device that's sitting in a service department and it's a desktop and it's plugged in with a, an ethernet cable you know you don't need to be looking as much at putting in multi-factor authentication if a user is logging on there and that is if say it's a surface tablet that can connect from the internet so you know, I suppose it's probably a layering of the approach depending on, on the location of the devices somewhat as well, so. Uh, Romanus, if you'd like to follow up with that. Yeah, so uh, I, I'll start with what is the living of the land attack just for, 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 for a better understanding for all the participants, right? So it is like uh, the organization provided endpoint uh, in the organization network, using the known organization provided identity and using the authenticated or approved applications like WMI uh, PowerShell, right? When an attack is happening in this combination, so unless you thoroughly understand what is your endpoints behavior and what is it, uh, the current, uh, current behavior is changed, then you will stand no chance to identify that, right? So this is kind of uh, a tricky attack where 
unless you have collecting, uh, you have started collecting telemetry data and baseline the behavior, right? So this this endpoint, <coughs> excuse me, this endpoint uh, logs in at this time, and this person uses it. Usually, only these process would be running on that, and this would be connecting to these network resources. And at this time, this goes down, right? This I'm just saying this is the base understanding, baseline of the behavior of the endpoint. Now, one fine day when there is more process running and it is contacting a server, which usually doesn't uh, contact. Now that's where the behavior is moved to suspicious, right? Now, only when you, when you monitor continuously, only when you, uh, you are able to understand the baseline of behavior of that, you should be able to stop that or find that as a malicious or suspicious to malicious, and then uh, you should be able to stop it. So a continuous monitoring and uh, protection of that uh, is going to uh, prevent such living of the land attack. Uh, another question from the floor. Romanus, I, I'd like to ask you this one first before moving back to Enda. Uh, certain industries need to take specific action for remote access to customer personal information. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to ensure this information is being managed securely in a remote location? Okay, this, this, this is very wide. So this is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is related to privacy, right? right? So um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not getting the use case, whether uh, there is a UU, uh, 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 European data center and there is uh, the rest of the world. And if an organization has uh, uh, the need to uh, have uh, data shared between their employees across the data center, the UU uh, data is going to reside in a UU data center. And from there, you should have access only to the authorized authenticated person and they should be able to access it. Uh, uh, it's, it should not be stored outside the uh, European uh, data centers according to uh, GDPR policies. Uh, and if you'd like to follow up on that. Um, well, I suppose the ability to access the data um, will be based on the user's um, their, their need to access the data, but in order to actually, like, because by default, a lot of our data is stored remotely, so I don't know whether it means remote access as in with the user being remote, so like we have multi-factor authentication, obviously, for users signing in remotely. So that would uh, restrict access to the data. Um, I, I don't know if it's coming from that angle, but um, as, again, as what Romanus is saying, like we have to be sure, sure where our data is actually being stored when we're using a hosted service, like um, ensuring that servers are within the EU and that it's been stored in a GDPR compliant manner. So I'm not sure if that's the, the, the focus of the question, but certainly for users, who are remote who are accessing the data, then we would definitely harden the um, security requirements for them to get at that data. Uh, Romanus, one thing you've talked about in the past is the importance of managing rights and permissions uh, consistently. If you'd like to expand uh, a little bit on that challenge. Uh, sorry. Uh... You know, can, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Sure. Uh, one of the so topics you've spoken on before has been the importance of managing rights and per permissions consistently. Um, if you'd like to expand on that a little bit for us. Uh, yeah. So, uh, okay. So this is like, uh, uh, think about the uh, living of the land attack, right? So, uh, uh, you should have documented the permissions and access of uh, applications the end user is given with, right? Now, uh, when there is uh, a change, when uh, there is uh, 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 a change in the access permissions for him to access more applications or access more data, then that has to be brought and your EDR detection uh, should be able to find that and then uh, bring that to
to uh, notification, right? Uh, if you uh, if you go back in terms of managing uh, those incidents, right? We used to have uh, uh, IT operations and security operation, right? Earlier, they two uh, two distinct separate uh, teams which would do that just in case when the permission is changed when the application or additional incident uh, uh, because of that uh, incident has happened. Now, uh, the security team or you would call a uh, forensic or IR team to just go and do the investigation. So that's going to be external altogether in the beginning. Then, then the organization started having their IT operations team separately and this security operations investigation separately. Now, during pandemic or after that, what we see is there is more uh, collaboration or more merger in terms of that so that every IT team uh, has the need to go in terms of security aspects and find uh, when they talk about the asset, they also talk about uh, the security aspects, uh, incidents which they could connect with that. I think uh, that is something that uh, I want to convey on this. And you mentioned uh, permissions before as being sort of a, a, an issue. Um, how has your experience of that been? Do you find that you're constantly revising your commission's policy, your permissions policy, or is it something you've been happy enough with? Uh, it's, uh, it, sorry, wrong one. Let's go ahead. No, good, good, good. Well, you know, from our point of view, it's it's a balancing act, really. Uh, from the from what information and what data that the user should have access to and needs to have access to in order to be able to do their job. Say, for example, a salesperson looking up a customer's service history or sales history. Um, but apart from that, then as well, how far does that go? Because we we would also say have um, financial records for customers sometimes as well. So that the uh, accessibility to that kind of data has to be far more limited. So it's oh, it's it's constantly a balancing act, I suppose, is the answer now, really. And we're so we're constantly looking at it to make sure that we actually have it right. Mm. Uh, Romanus, of course, you're looking at much larger organizations. Um, uh, do you find consistency is really a problem? Uh, yes. See, um, particularly when uh, the organization is distributed and there is no uh, centralized management for this. And then there you have the challenges, right? Um, for example, uh, during pandemic, uh, people started giving local uh, administrative privilege, the missions which are in work from home, right? Because uh, there have been a lot of uh, requests in terms of installing application, upgrading applications, a lot of stuff uh, because of the sudden change in the uh, uh, the way they manage the endpoints, right? So uh, they have to grant or delegate the responsibility of managing that endpoints by giving them the local administrative privilege. Now, what uh, happened is basically that people started installing applications, and mostly because of uh, the entertainment websites or the games, what they would have, the plugins, the extensions, what they have on the browsers. Uh, there were a lot of ransomware which could easily come inside and wait for an opportunity to enter into the business network, right? Now, we, we could see a lot of such things being captured and uh, stopped um, and uh, uh, having uh, a review policy of uh, ch checking all those stuff where uh, um, it's a huge task, right? So we, we have uh, started experiencing during the pandemic time, uh, time where uh, most of the customers who have uh, done such a higher level privilege uh, granting uh, had a lot of challenges and uh, they were not able to uh, recheck, go revisit everything and change it. So that has to be done at a later stage. Uh, Romanus, I'd like to stick with you on this next question to do with uh, endpoint exodus. If you'd like to define the term for us and sort of speak a little bit about the particular threats that it poses. Okay, so so we, we coined uh, exodus of endpoints, basically 
during this pandemic, right? Before pandemic, all the endpoints were within the secured perimeter, right? You have your firewall, IDS, IPS. Uh, so everything was within the organization. And probably maximum of 10 to 15% of endpoints who are basically a road warriors who are away. So the bandwidth for uh, that management and the number of resources, what you have to have to manage them were limited. Now, one fine day, all these endpoints have moved outside the organization. Now you have lost the luxury of doing a delayed patching, selective patching, right? Uh, uh, upgrading your servers, at, uh, I, I mean, uh, updating the business applications at your leisure. You cannot do that. And every endpoint which is away from your secured perimeter has to have the same level of security and protection what it had when they were inside the organization. Now, each endpoint has to be given with the same importance of managing your whole perimeter, right? That's the huge level of task which they had. Even, uh, I think of, uh, I used to say, patching is your first line of defense, right? Even for that to happen, you should think about the bandwidth, right? So the, the, the patches uh, which were available uh, for the endpoints were huge in size. Now you have to think about the bandwidth what the end user has. So you have to find availability of the endpoint and make sure that what time the endpoint could be able to take these downloads and ensure that they are completely downloaded and being patched there. And similar to this, there are a lot of challenges in terms of, we were talking about the blind spot, right? Now, when the endpoints are not in organization within the secure perimeter, but away from the organization, what you do, uh, the, the, the previous case of giving uh, additional elevated privilege. Now, what problems they invite into their endpoints uh, is uh, unpredictable. It is predictable or it, you should be able to find that only when these endpoints come back to your uh, headquarters or your organizational network. Now, during that time, if you don't have a proper setup to quarantine these devices and check the security portion of the endpoint against what your organization uh, uh, has defined, then it becomes too tedious because it could bring in a lot of problems into the production network and that could cause the business. So the exodus, the journey of the endpoints from inside the organization to every nook and corner of the country and from there coming back is a huge pain where there were even the routine uh, jobs, tasks that we were doing in terms of security had taken multiple level of uh, pain just to manage those endpoints. Penta, have you had a, a, a similar problem? Uh, well, one thing I, I would say, and, and, and this is um, an unsolicited plug for Manage Engine, is whenever our devices actually did leave the organization, we didn't have to allow local admin rights to any users because we could manage them using Manage Engine uh, Desktop Central. So that was very, very helpful at the time that all the devices did kind of head out. Um, yeah, um, we have had, you know, we have had a lot of them come back in as well more more recently, but um, I suppose we have we have noticed that we we have to keep a close eye on them, but we haven't found, you know, maybe we haven't looked properly, but we haven't found anything hugely dangerous that has come back into us as of yet anyway. Uh, we're keeping an eye yeah. on the uh, Q&A for any additional questions from the floor. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to circle back to our um, to our polls from earlier in the webinar and particularly looking at the point of confidence um, in looking at uh, organizations uh, ability to deal with problems. To, uh, Romanus, have you ever come across any particularly uh, particular examples of misplaced confidence? Uh, is that a question to me? Yes. Oh, please come again. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Have you, given that there seems to be an awful lot of confidence in our audience about how they are adapting to um, 
to uh, endpoint security problems. Have you found any examples of misplaced confidence or do you think people are quite realistic in their approach? Uh, yes, I think uh, people are more confident, uh, confident in terms of managing the endpoints, um, particularly when we talk about our customers as and as said. So you don't have to have uh, um, uh, like uh, do a lot of things in terms of granting uh, permissions or uh, uh, having a local user privilege. I was giving an example, right? Those things are automatically taken care of by the agent, right? So what you have to do is define a policy for the organization for the set of targets. It's going to be uh, doing its job on those computers, come back and tell you what is the status of that, right? So, um, um, if you are, uh, we were talking about certain uh, uh, strategy for the endpoint security, right? Uh, first level is about known vulnerability. Second level is about the blind spot. Third level is about your unknown unknown, right? So this is already built into the product, right? When you properly do the patching, it takes care of the first level of defense, right? All the vulnerabilities. The vulnerability is known to the vendor, right? known to the uh, customer and also known to the threat actor. So this is very important for any customer, any individual to patch their network because the vulnerability is uh, exploitable by the threat actor because it's known to them, right? Now, all these strategies are aligned in the product. So when you, when you are able to use the product uh, appropriate and have a strategic uh, uh, scheduled deployments, you should be able to manage them. So I think from uh, experience with our customers' point of view, yes, they have gained more confidence in terms of protecting their endpoints. And uh, I'll give you the last word on this. Um, what particular things are give you more confidence about endpoint security? Is it sort of securing the, the human element? Um, well, yeah, the human element is huge. You know, it's kind of, it's the misplaced email or even SMS. Like, I think it wasn't the Uber hack recently that was an SMS that was, <laughs> that, you know, that scares you as, as an IT professional that the attack could come from anywhere. Um, I think trying, locking down is probably the wrong phrase used, but securing the endpoints so that the users only have a certain amount of um uh, access or the appropriate access so they don't have the access to cause problems and to to cause damage or to allow uh, bad actors to get in that's really um you know the focus and then on top of that once you add in the training part of it like i think i've mentioned it many times <laughs> this morning once you add in the training part in that to actually try and limit the the vulnerability there as well um i think you know it, it's I think you know, when you, you and I were talking before now we talked about like the layered approach and what Romanus is talking about there as well is just kind of you build one on top of the other that you need to actually have a layer strategy for this to, to hopefully uh, limit the damage and even if somebody does get in that the damage can be restricted as well from from there. Great. Thank you so much, Romanus and Enda, for Thank spending you. some time with us this morning. Uh, you can now switch off your cameras if you feel so inclined. Um, and that's it for TechFire this morning in association with Manage Engine. Um, again, thank you all for your time and your input. It was great to see some uh, engagement in the Q&A. Uh, of course, I invite you to keep an eye out for Rolling News. Uh, the Daily Technology Minute newsletter, and of course, Tech Radio podcast on techcentral.ie, where we also recently talked about automation and no code platforms with Manage Engine. So, thanks everybody for your time, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, sir.